Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Good morning, friends. Great to have you with me online. This is the 24th of April. Can you believe that? We're nearly at the end of another month. Uh, and I know it's a bit cliche to say that, sort of week in and week out. But as we record for you, uh, I'm so aware that time just marches on. And it's my prayer that since we last met online, that all is well with you, that you've had a blessed, blessed Easter time, and that you're looking forward to the rest of the month that lies ahead. And uh, as Sheila reminded us by reading Psalm 150 for us, and thank you, Sheila, for doing that, that we are here to celebrate and praise the Lord and to give Him glory for all that He is and all that He does. And as that psalm ended, and let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And so get your breath ready with me as we're going to praise the Lord together uh, in our worship time. And that hymn too that spoke to us of our need to come and celebrate. Great is our faithfulness. And then went on to say, morning by morning, new mercies I see. So welcome. Great to have you with me. Our Easter weekend was really busy for us at St. Thomas, and I'm sure it was also for you, wherever you joined us online from, and pray that if you were with a community there too, that you had a blessed Easter gathering, that you could come together. Uh, for example, as we did on Thursday night, we had our Tenebrae service, then Good Friday on the Friday morning, and then our two services on Easter Sunday. And so we, we ended up in church on Sunday, reminding ourselves that we are the Easter people that we are the resurrection people. And I want to urge you to hear that again online this morning. That as you join with me, join as an Easter person, as someone who says, yes, I understand the death and the resurrection of Jesus was for me. Don't understand how it all worked, but I understand Jesus lived and died for me. He rose again. And so I am an Easter person, a resurrection person. I'm going to follow on with that idea now as I share the reading for us for this week, which is Acts chapter 5 from verse 27. When they had brought them, that's Peter and John and some of the apostles, when they had brought them, they had them stand before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to teach in his name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, that he might give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. And so the, the key verse to, to focus on this week is at verse 32, the last one. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit. Now the reading for this week from Acts, we need to place in its correct timeline. And there's a risk that if we don't do that, then we rush from the Resurrection Sunday of Easter to the events of this week, as I've just read for you, as if they were only one week apart. We tend to read the Bible chronologically, don't we? And so we think that this, the next event happens quite soon after the last one. And that would not be true for the story we read today in the context of Easter Sunday. Because our Acts passage happens a few months after Resurrection Sunday. 
And during those few months, during that time, the apostles have gone from being afraid, from hiding away from the authorities. And John chapter 20, verse 19. The heading is, Jesus appears to his disciples. And that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. And the disciples, they go from this moment of fear, with Jesus appearing to them, to convince them that he's not dead, but he's alive. They go from that fearful place to being full blown evangelists, courageous uh, and very public about their witness and their work for the Lord. So they've gone from sharing frightened whispers in a locked room to now a, a thunderstorm of preaching and miracles that are sweeping new converts into their numbers every day. The apostles in this last few months have also been thrown in jail a number of times. They've had miraculous escapes from jail. They did not run away during this time like they ran away, for example, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane when, when Jesus was arrested. No more running away, but they are now carrying on loud and proud with their preaching and their teaching and the works of miracles and healing. And they're doing all of this in the public areas, right? So they're not even doing this in secret. They're out there in the faces of the authorities, in the market squares, in the temple surrounds, temple places, and they are arrested again and again. So Luke, the gospel writer, remember Luke also writes the book of Acts. So Luke, the writer of Acts, tells us that circumstances even reached the point where the prison guards who had been ordered to detain the disciples were becoming intimidated and fearful of carrying out their duties. And they were now overwhelmed too by what was going on. So Acts chapter 5 from verse 17. The high priest and his officials, who were Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail and brought them out. Then he told them, go to the temple and give the people this message of life. So at daybreak, the apostles entered the temple as they were told, and immediately began teaching, right? Loud and proud public space. When the high priest and his officials arrived, they convened the high council, the full assembly of the elders of Israel. Then they sent for the apostles to be brought from the jail for trial. Right? Problem, because they're not in the jail anymore. But when the temple guards went to the jail, the men were gone. So they returned to the council and reported the jail was securely locked with the guards standing outside. But when we opened the gates, no one was there. Can you visualize that dilemma? When the captain of the temple guard and the leading priests heard this, they were perplexed, wondering where it would all end. Then someone arrived with startling news. The men you put in jail are standing in the temple teaching the people. The captain of the guard went with his temple guards and arrested the apostles, but without violence, for they were afraid the people would stone them. Wow. Friends, do, do you begin to get the picture of the glorious chaos? Of that sense of wonder that's driving the apostles and their early ministry. Each time they are arrested, the apostles are emboldened and become more courageous in the approach. They don't back down from the threats of the authorities. The clarity of their calling and the understanding of their mission seems to grow with each event, with each pressure and problem. It seems to grow. Their calling grows stronger. Time and time again, Peter and the others say, we are witnesses. They even say, we don't bow down to human authority. Our authority is God. Right? The proof of that, Acts 4 verse 19. Peter and John replied to the temple authorities and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. 
Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. So I hope that you're beginning to understand that I'm leading us into that place where I need you to catch something of the energy and the wonder and the vision and the purpose and the excitement and the passion of this early church. They filled with such commitment and courage. And there's a very public display of their calling evidence for us. Friends, their faith is active. In fact, what they believed about Jesus was put on display for all to hear and see. And so remember our theme for this week, we are witnesses. Well, the apostles' defense each time they were faced with pressure was, we are witnesses to what we've seen and heard. We can't keep quiet. We are witnesses. Now thinking about the word witness or witnesses, I'd like you to ask to think about a court case or a trial. And in a, in a court proceedings, witnesses then give evidence to what they saw at the scene of the crime. And they each bring their own story, their own version of what they have seen or what they heard. And each story is really important on its own. But then the judge or the magistrate has to take those stories uh, and add them together, doesn't he? To try, or she, to try and get a, a, a broader picture of what was going on beginning to outline for the court's mind, right, what happened at that place and at that time. And I, I outline that idea that each story is a little different from the other. Because we know in a court of law that that proves, in a sense, the validity of what is being said. If everybody says exactly the same thing, then the story is concocted. It's been put together for a reason. But if each of the witnesses are saying something slightly different about the same event that they all saw from their different angle and perspective. It makes a lot of sense to the court. And so here the apostles are, here the other followers are, and they are all witnesses, all from within their own perspective, their own place, seeing what is, has happened and what is going on. And they can't keep quiet about it. So I'm sure... The temple authorities were told all sorts of stories by the apostles and the followers. But Peter and John make it clear, don't they, that they were the first-hand witnesses to the arrest and the crucifixion, the resurrection, and then after the resurrection of Jesus, the ongoing ministry that he gave to them as he met with them, as he, he, he spoke to them, as he taught them, as he broke bread with them. Very different picture of the Peter who betrayed Jesus. I don't know the man. To the one who's now publicly saying, I know him and I'm going to tell you about him. They were there and what they had witnessed changed them. Changed them from being fearful, spiritual weaklings to courageous and mighty apostles. Remember the word apostle is someone who teaches with authority. Man, these changes make you think, eh? Don't they? I hope they do get you thinking. Because after all, we are witnesses. That's where we will go in our conversation together this morning. But the apostles were not only telling people about what they had seen. The apostles were also now doing something very new. They were doing something more. They were living out what they believed. So being a witness or living out as a witness for them meant that all of their life was now giving witness in voice and in practical ways to what they had witnessed happen with Jesus. So in word, in other words, and action. So the theme, we are witnesses, does not mean then, I will only tell you about what happened. But we are witnesses means, 
living out the faith that we talk about for others to see in action. And that's what the early church leaders were doing. They were saying we saw something and what we saw changed us. And now as witnesses, we are becoming something more. Think of that phrase, becoming something more. Come and join us, says Peter. The apostles are not the only witnesses, are they, in our story. We are told that the Holy Spirit is too. Peter said that. We are the, our witnesses and so is the Holy Spirit. And remember your teachings here at St. Thomas of the Holy Spirit being the third person of the Trinity. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. One presence, three persons. And so what Peter is saying is here that even God is bearing witness, giving witness to what is going on too. We are witnesses and so is the Holy Spirit and so is God. Interesting too that he says we are witnesses in this way for repentance and forgiveness. That if, even if you understand what you have done to Jesus and to the Messiah, there is a, an option for forgiveness for starting over again. That's why the Holy Spirit is involved too, for repentance and for forgiveness. So Peter is saying, we standing here before you, we are witnesses. By the way, authorities, you need to understand God himself is a witness to what happened to Jesus. And God is also witnessing what's happening to us as the apostles. I'm sure that was the implication too. And to what they are becoming, what they are growing into, what they are being shaped as, which is the leaders of the early church, the teachers, those who would guide others in the faith. So friends, today I want to remind you again, as I began the message with you this morning, to remember that we are people of the resurrection. We are resurrection people. We are Easter people. And we need to celebrate that. And we celebrate in faith then this witness and the, the life of faith that must be obvious and must be fruitful. We are Christ followers. We don't just speak about what we believe. We are determined to live out, surely. Determined to live out what we believe. Empowered by who God is through the Holy Spirit. Shaped by His love. And sent to, sent to share this good news, to bear witness to the good news who is Jesus. So just as the apostles were changed by what they witnessed and how the Holy Spirit was working in them, so you and I too must be changed. And as we are changed and, and transformed by God in our relationship with Him, so we must make a transforming impact on the lives of others. And I say transforming because it's an ongoing process. Our responsibility, friends, is to transform in Jesus' name and through the work of the Holy Spirit those around us. Our work is to transform in Jesus' name and through the work of the Holy Spirit the world around us. Literally. Creation. So it's about lives, it's about planet. It's about, it's about people and livelihoods. That's what it means to be a witness. As a witness, my faith and, and your faith must impact our lives and the life of other people. And also through us then, our faith must impact the environment that you and I are part of. So it's not okay for Christ followers to abuse the planet to destroy the ecology, to ignore the rising levels of poverty. It's an abuse of another kind. There are all those elements too that we need to confront when we are being witnesses. Now, exciting. Here we go. In terms of a practical tool for you, a preparation for you to be able to go out there and live your life in the way God is calling you. Well, we're going to launch Alpha uh, early in May here at St. Thomas. 
and I invite you to come and be part of the Alpha Online or Alpha Film Series as we also call it here at St. Thomas. And for some of you it might be the very first time that you are introduced to Jesus uh, in this particular way. For others of us who have been on a walk with Jesus for a while, coming to the Alpha course will help us revive and, and re-establish and reinvigorate our faith. And this first Alpha course really is about getting us all on board so we understand how important evangelism is into our lives and then through our lives into the lives of others. And Richard will guide us through that. He and his team uh, of Alpha leaders will guide us through the course. And let's do this together for the next number of weeks here at St. Thomas. And then from next year, we are emboldened and prepared and ready to get out there and use Alpha again to bring people into the kingdom. But maybe first of all, we need to experience it for ourselves. And Richard's already asked us, who will we invite? Now you might say, Tim, I'm joining you online. I'm overseas somewhere. I can't do this Alpha thing if I'm overseas. And you would be wrong. Because we're going to do Alpha the film series both online and in church simultaneously. How cool is that? So you can join us from wherever you are. What you do need to do is uh, contact our church office. Our details are on the website. Uh, there's a letter from Richard on our website with his email address as well. Uh, and just contact him and we will coordinate how to set you up on the course. But there is no need for you to miss out. Whether you are far away or in Plet, we invite you. Come and join us. Come and join us in May for Alpha. And we will help you with new skills and new abilities, new passion, and a re-energized, invigorated faith. Or we will introduce you to Jesus for the first time. And you'll learn the wonder of what it means to become a witness. And so friends, to draw this to a close, being a witness, we are witnesses, must be seen as faith in action. And faith in action through our works of, of mission, our community projects, our acts of generosity and compassion. And so yes, think of the flooding, the terrible floods in KwaZulu-Natal and the Eastern Cape areas, some areas of the Free State as well. And we do need to respond in those ways. And the Methodist Church is. It's coordinating all the Methodist uh, congregation's responses with other churches. So if you'd like to be involved with that again, contact our church office. The details are on the website. And so we are there. We give witness in times of flood and disaster. We are there for the homeless and the poor and the vulnerable. An obvious challenge to you and me, which I call the, the elephant in the room is that does the faith lived in the Acts way require that we learn the courage and the skills to stand against secular authority or political authorities or the authorities that run our local communities? Do we have the right to stand against those authorities if they are not acting in accordance with God's will and purpose? Of course we do. And I think sometimes as Christ followers, we are too polite. Peter replied to the authorities in his day, we must obey God rather than any human authority. And so I need to ask you that sort of elephant in the room question, right? What does that mean to obey God rather than other authorities? What does that mean for you and me in our place in our communities, in our place, in our country? What does it mean for us to say we live with kingdom objectives and kingdom values rather than the values of the world? What would it mean to live with kingdom values in your life, personally speaking, in your life, or in your business life? You see, answering that question as God expects us to answer, reminds us that witnessing and living out our faith for Jesus will bring consequences. We must not forget today 
that Peter and John and the other apostles paid for their courageous confrontation of the high priest, in other words, representing the orders of the day, in painful ways, in many times in painful ways. Verse 40, they called in the apostles and had them flogged. Remember, many people died from floggings in those days. So they called them in, they had them flogged, and then they ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let them go. And then verse 41, the apostles left the high council meeting rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer and to face disgrace for the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they continue to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. Friends, I don't want to end the message on a negative tone, but I just needed to paint a realistic picture for us as well. That persecution for their faith would become a frightening and life-threatening reality for the Christ followers. And history teaches us that many thousands and thousands of Christ followers would over the years and the centuries be killed for their faith. And so when I ask you to live as the Easter people or live as people of the resurrection, there's a sense there of, of spiritual romance and wonder at what that is. Okay, We embrace the excitement and the glory of that. When we celebrate and we sing and we dance and we must, we must, as the psalmist said, praise the Lord where? In his sanctuary and in the mighty heavens and praise the Lord with trumpets and voices and lyres and harps and loud clashing cymbals. We must do all of that. Absolutely. Praise him with every breath. Yes. But not just with the romance of the praises. But understanding that there's also sometimes a harsh and painful reality for many who live a life for Jesus. Being a witness for Jesus can mean rejection and suffering. So, at this time, many Christ followers are still persecuted and imprisoned and killed for their faith. At this time, and I think of members and congregations I've met over the years, at this time, too, some who become Christ followers will lose relationships within their family circles or their friendship circles. Others, I can recall, lost their employment. Can you believe that? And so the reality of being a witness says there is a cost. And so we celebrate and we rejoice and, if necessary, we embrace the cost and the price for being a follower. And that should be so. Being a witness to the love and the grace of God, His Father, well, cost Jesus His life, didn't it? But friends, I want to encourage you and say that the, the cost of faith that might be there for you must never silence you. And the obvious dangers and pressures that will come at times must never destroy our passion and our witness for the Lord. We must be committed to celebrate and share this message of Jesus with our friends and our family and with the world because that is our calling as brothers and sisters of Jesus. After all, said Peter, we are witnesses to what we've seen and heard. And so we in Jesus' name have this wonderful new life to share with everyone. It is the life that comes from the empty tomb. It's the life of the living Jesus. It is the life that can change the world. We are witnesses and we remind ourselves the Holy Spirit is a witness too. And that calls people to repentance and forgiveness and a new life with Jesus. And so we in his name invite all to join with us. And become witnesses too. We'll teach you how to do that in Alpha as well. Have a blessed week. Amen. Friends, thank you for your gifts and your tithes and your blessings. And especially if you join us online Sunday to Sunday. Uh, remember our ministry online has a cost involved. So we would appreciate you blessing the ministry 
through a contribution uh, to cover the costs. And our details are on the website. I'm going to lead us in a prayer, uh, and we, a prayer of thanks for our gifts, and also a prayer where we remember our calling to be there for others. So let's pray together. Mighty God of resurrection power, you offer us life that overcomes death, light that overcomes darkness, hope that overcomes our deepest despair. What response could we offer? Our tithes and gifts? Yes. But our minds, hearts, bodies, and witness as well. May our minds be about understanding who you are and who you long for us to be in this world. May our hearts overflow with your love and compassion for the poor, the oppressed, and the forgotten. May our bodies carry us out of the tombs of isolation to engage our neighbors as sisters and brothers. May our witness be the alleluias we take with us to bring hope to everyone we meet. In the risen Christ we pray. Amen.